There's only one way to enter the so-called fire zone, and that's with an army which these past few months has fought a relentless push war against guerrillas opposed to President Obote. They led the way as we crossed into Luero district. Only an hour from Kampala may be, but at once we saw the first of many deserted and devastated villages now under army control. Settlements where no one is allowed to walk, let alone reclaim their homes. A mile further and the first of the few groups of refugees who are now living in army controlled camps. These people are all from the Baganda tribe, once the aristocrats of Uganda. Now they chant support for their long standing enemy, the president, and his party, UPC. They have no choice. A war made largely in their name has left them victims of a fierce campaign to stamp out insurrection in Uganda at large. When I leave it to my own countrymen and women, if they want a difficult time, <clears throat> they will support these lawless elements. If they want stability, if they want rehabilitation, if they want peace, if they want prosperity, I call upon them not to support such persons, but to report them immediately so that the security forces can deal with them and deal with them quickly. There are now 140,000 people living in government camps like this one at Kapeka, deep in the bush north of Kampala. Homes made of banana leaves and straw. But once we found evidence of malnutrition and starvation that has become an epidemic this past year. Children suffering unmistakably from marasmus, starvation, and core protein deficiency. The sight of it alone was enough to shock Bill Turkham, MBE, CBE, an experienced Africa hand who's now been given the job by the government of taking charge of these refugees. I never expected to see this in Uganda. I never ever thought I'd see this in Uganda. It has shocked me. Every day nurses from Save the Children and Oxfam handle more than 500 cases in their feeding station here. In their own minds it's something of a losing battle against hunger, disease and fear among the people they care for. In this child's case, there's a vain struggle against a combination of using starvation and severe dehydration that had him refusing every attempt to make him drink. If the conditions within these camps are one cause for concern among the relief agencies, then so too is the situation outside them. The government does admit that their troops are now under orders to kill any male living in areas once occupied by the guerrillas. But people fleeing into camps like this report an army regime which goes well beyond those orders. There is, according to independent sources, including the churches, hardly a family in these camps that hasn't lost a relative, as the army has swept up through their villages, determined to destroy any local support for the guerrillas. Yet this is the army supposed to be protecting them. At the main hospital in the area, a German doctor told me that he has, on average, 30 cases a week who are victims of the troops. He led us to one. She had a gunshot through the left and right upper leg and uh, right lower arm and one shoot uh, in the abdomen. Does she know who did it? Yes, uh, she told us soldiers. And the story was the soldiers were drunken and was, were afraid because on this day three soldiers were killed in a village uh, about three miles in the north. A child who'd filmed a matter of minutes before, the one too weak to drink, had died in his mother's arms. A makeshift parade ground in the heart of the Luero Triangle. Amaloji, ama, ama, ama. The Ugandan government dismisses these rebels as bad. They see themselves as national safety. Four years ago, this man, Luari Museveni, led 27 disaffected soldiers into the bush. Today, his national resistance army numbers an estimated 6,000. The Ugandan army's fighting methods against this rebellion have brought it into the centre of a human rights controversy. And the rebels are convinced that their fight is a justice. What else can we do if, uh, if you have got a government which has closed off or other channels of uh, peaceful change, what else could we do except to surrender, to resign ourselves to slavery, and we couldn't do that.
as long as the people were willing. Because this is their own war. The people are actually the ones who, who urged us on to fight. If we do not have this support, we would never have started such a war. So it is to the people's benefit themselves. And the fact that they have been, they have been able to bear this suffering as we have seen is a testimony to, to the fact that this is their own war. These people are just using us. We are the instruments. If we had not started the war, we would have been declared traitors. We studied the dynamics of the situation. We knew that although we, were, we had 27 armed people, but we represented millions of potential soldiers. These thousands here, they were all, uh, they were all civilians, all peasants. Many of them were peasants. So although the 27 armed people uh, were a small number, they represented a huge force of uh, potential soldiers. And we knew that with the correct tactics, we could enable the 27 to mobilize the millions who were on our side, but were not properly organized. But also have been organizing among other strata, like for instance the intellectuals from the towns, and also in the working class, and also the big businessmen. We also mobilize among them, as you can see, people of our external committee, many of them are middle class people. So we educate everybody who is willing to work with us. Early morning and a patrol from the 70th Army moves out to prepare an ambush. They're constantly trying to catch military convoys to replenish their weapon and ammunition supplies. This time they settle themselves just off the main road from Kampala. Some wait in the grass, while 20 yards ahead, comrades open fire as soldiers are spotted unexpectedly. Smoke from a grenade rises. Two government soldiers have stumbled into the ambush by accident, travelling along a track off the main road. The Ugandan government has always said that much of the evidence of fighting is fabricated. There's nothing fake about this man. Papers show that one of the soldiers had been given a day's leave to visit his sick child. The officer in charge explains that the two men had arrived while they were waiting for the convoy. And he said they had to be killed so yes, because they might otherwise alert the, the army to the rest of the and miss the vehicle. Not quite the booty they'd hoped for, but the bodies are stripped of everything that might be useful before the patrol moves on. Shortage of supplies hampers the rebels more than any other single factor. They once had some from Libya, but those dried up two years ago. Colonel Gaddafi's conditions were too demanding. Now everything is plundered from the government forces. Lack of ammunition and proximity to the enemy means in training they simulate the <laughs> Far cry from the sort of training the officer in charge will have gone through. He was at the Mons Military Training School in Britain. Just as rigorous as the military training is the troops' political education. A crash course in political science. The movement espouses it's the whole fashion like mixed fight. economy and a thorough grounding in modern Ugandan history, or at least the rebel leadership's version of what Ugandan happened since independence and what part Obote has played. Because Obote did not value self-determination. He valued the education of the people of the North. And in fact, it did not need the people of the North. It meant himself. The National Resistance Movement is a nationalist organization. It is a nationalist uh, in the sense that it is fighting for the aims of the whole country and not for aims of a section of the country. Secondly, the national resistance movement is a democratic movement. It is a movement which is fighting for democracy. Like this 14-year-old, many have joined the movement because they say they or their families have been ill-treated by the government troops. Speaking through an interpreter, the child said he'd seen his mother hacked to pieces with a machete by government soldiers. And there are 
number of army deserters who claimed to have been sickened by what they were ordered to do while they were serving in the army. We went on operation in Narua district, whereby an operation commander ordered the soldiers, the troops, to kill, smash everything defining the operation area. Government troops in training. The authorities point out that they've been faced with the problem of rebuilding a disciplined and controllable army in the wake of the chaos left by Amin's fall. First, they had the help of a Commonwealth team, and there's still a small contingent of British troops training them now. But the people of the Luero Triangle say it isn't working. The rebels showed these skeletons as evidence of what the government forces have been doing. They said a village of civilians friendly to the rebels had been wiped out. The government claims that the atrocities are being committed by the rebels themselves and the bones might just as well belong to their victims. And they dismiss as fabrication stories like those told by this priest. Himself bearing the scar from the attack, he said that in one incident troops had taken a six-month child from its mother and pounded it to death with a pestle and water used for breaking up ground nuts. It is estimated to 15,000. 10,000 being killed or massacred, and 5,000, about 5,000, have, have died uh, from disease. That he runs away from Obote, who is killing them, has been killing them, is killing them, even recently was sharing them. They were just very worthy to start. But he will be hiding until the war ends. The fighting has left one of Uganda's richest regions almost completely depopulated. Once prosperous villages now lie deserted. This is prime country for growing coffee, Uganda's most important export. Now the beans hang unharvested on the trees, left for the rebels to pick at will. The few civilians that remain in the area live in fear, hidden deep in the bush. They survive off what little they can cull from this once heavily cultivated land. There has been a let-up in the killing in the last few months. The rebels say that's because there are so few left to kill. And they claim conditions now compare badly even to the Amin. Well, they are very much worse than they were under Amin. Because under Amin, first of all, Idi Amin was not killing uh, people outside the intellectual class. He used to kill only the, the, the elite, elements from the elite, who were threatening his position, or sometimes uh, over rivalry, over business, things like that. But he never taxed the peasantry. But Obote is killing everybody. With talk like that, there seems little hope that the rebels will come in from their life in the bush. Every ten days or so, they dismantle their mobile headquarters, pack up the guns they've captured from the government, and move on. The houses they've constructed are destroyed, so that the camps can't be used by the government forces. A new set will have to be built at the next stopping point. Because of the rebels' mobility and the continuing problems of the Ugandan army, there seems little hope of the government finding a military solution. As far as a political solution is concerned, President Obote has said he won't negotiate with the rebels, but he will hold elections this year. Certainly this is that as a shadow. He and his men will press on. The common characteristic is that uh, uh, a popular cause, which is very popular, but backed by initially irregular forces, forces which are not regular armies, and which are, which are not as armed as the establishment army, uh, by using uh, guerrilla tactics, eventually they build up enough strength to overwhelm the enemy. <laughs> Seven <laughs> a close ally of the former president for many years.
to the shallow well to overthrow Idi Amin and restore a vote into power. But today he was calling a vote a dictator as he took his place as head of state. For a long time, the authorities had tried to discredit the members, downplaying their numbers, and them as an indisciplined group of country bandits. But the government's attempt to defeat them was a grisly failure. People suspected of supporting the guerrillas were killed by the score. And under Obote, Uganda acquired an unenviable reputation for unbridled repression and murder. <laughs> Mpaka adui mwenye wanachoka na anaingia kwenye kitu bachetu. We are hopeful that the brotherly spirit that is being portrayed by Ugandans sitting around the table will, will result in a full resolution of this issue. These groups with whom we have already reached some understanding are in Uganda. They have put down their arms and they are cooperating fully and participating fully in the process of bringing about lasting peace in our country. The head of state and the chairman of the military council, General Tito Kello, has time and time again stated that all Ugandans are welcome back home. If we have any problems or any differences that need to be discussed, Let's get home, discuss them in a family atmosphere, and... I know that by and large the, the name Uganda is associated with all the tragedy which has been unfolding in this land for the last many years. But today, you know, in Uganda we have a unique opportunity to begin a new era. In a field near Namalongi, the proof of the old era lies scattered in the brush. So far, the villagers say they've counted 7,008 skulls. For four years, a special forces unit under Robote had their barracks here, leaving behind its unique record of performance. What the government has done is to persuade some rebel groups who had fought against Obote to hand over their arms. They're not as strong as the NRA, but they now back the military council. Now they sing not for their cause, but for Uganda's as a whole. Whatever comes out of here, let to go to the council. Andrew Kayera is one of those rebel leaders who joined the military council, but he did not give up his arms. For now, he's concentrating on meetings, but soon he feels he may have to make a choice. We may not have to take sides yet till after some time. One thing that is making the situation difficult is uh, are the reports of uh, atrocities being committed by UNLA, the indiscipline in the UNLA. And that has been one of the items on the agenda today. And, uh, you know, I had to speak very strongly on it. Do you believe the report? Of course I do. There is no doubt that the killings are continuing. And that despite steps like this release of prisoners, Uganda's new leaders still aren't trusted. Part of the problem is the prisoners see some of the same faces they saw in the past. Tito Okello, the head of state, served under Obote. Amin Onzi headed the feared intelligence service under Idi Amin. Too many of the country's new leaders are old faces tainted with the past. And few Ugandans believe that they didn't play some role in the system they're now trying to change. Like Uganda after the coup, they're happy to see Obote out.
They're happy to have a little breather of freedom. But they can't quite believe that the new regime will bring peace. Well, at least in, in words and the deeds, they, they talk of change that they have changed. And they talk of peace. Uh, and they are not involved in the atrocities right now, if indeed they are genuine. But they have to show it by dealing with their juniors. Have they shown that yet? Well, not yet, not right now. And that's what I've been demanding. I want to see it soon, if not tomorrow. Broadly speaking, the difference is on whether we are going to hold uh, fellows who committed crimes in the past accountable for their crimes, or whether we should condone the, the, these crimes. I think that's why the other side is, is scared of some of these points, uh, uh, scared of an agreement. If you do not sign the agreement, will it be all out war? Well, of course the war is on. This war, the war is going on, so if the agreement is not signed, the war will go on until it is concluded by military means. Mm. You see, you see, you see, you see generalists are really, are, are really sensational. All out war, what's the difference between what is happening now and all out war? Because this is now all out war. <laughs> you see all these brothers, all these things that brothers depend mainly on intentions and partly on mechanisms provided for in the agreement. If the intentions are good and the principles of the peace agreement are good and the mechanisms are good, then the, the, the peace uh, treaty can hold. the world to understand this. The people of Uganda, the population, did not start violence. I was not a soldier, I was an intellectual. <laughs> Why did I become a soldier? I became a soldier to defend myself and my people against state-inspired violence. People were killed in 1964, our, our people were killed in 1966, our people were killed in 1969, Amin killed our people from 1971 to 1979, Milton Obote killed our people from 1981 to 1985, and the military council has been killing our people even recently. <laughs> Rebel forces in Uganda are said to be controlling most of the capital, Kampala, after two days of heavy fighting.
that what is happening today, what has, what has been happening in the last few days, is a mere change of guards. This is not a mere change of guards. I think this is a fundamental change in the politics of our country. Because in Africa we have seen so much change, that change has become meaningless. It's no longer change but merely turmoil. This group getting rid of that group and that group doing worse than the group it got rid of. Now, please I do not count us in that category of, of people. The National Resistance Movement, I think, is a clear-headed movement with clear objectives and with good membership, with good membership. I think it makes a very big difference from the situation in which we were, where the very people in power were they themselves encouraging evil instead of trying to combat evil. I think this, this is a slightly different situation. They went ahead with their old game of killing Ugandans. Since the signing of the peace agreement, uh, they had killed up something like 400 or 500 people whose names we could lay our hands on, names and uh, places of birth and things like that. Now, we found that if we didn't act, first of all, there would be no solution to the Ugandan political crisis. There would be no solution. We would go on endlessly with the same cycle of violence and uh, regime if you don't do any work. Secondly, we're also in danger of the people misunderstanding us, thinking that we have abandoned them and we are not working for the interests and they have had so much faith in us we could not afford such a thing. Because the politics of the past have been politics about intrigue, about uh, subterfuge, uh, this has been the, the politics of the past. Now we are, and the, the, this politics has not concerned the population. It has been about uh, job uh, seeking for the, on the part of the politicians. But now we are going to talk, for the first time, we are going to talk about the population, their life, their political rights, their economic interests. That will be the center of gravity of whatever we are doing.